Let's turn to 1 Chronicles 12, and we're going to read a passage here that has to do about David when he had been crowned, not crowned, but uh, proclaimed king in, in the previous chapter. King Saul had died already, King David now, he's now King David. And we, when we come to chapter 12, we're finding that many thousands from the tribes around him were coming around to see and to vouch for him as king, to pledge their allegiance to him as king. And they also pledged huge numbers of people as part of his standing army, men of valor. So let's pick up from there. And there's a big lesson here. God wants us to be like a certain kind of people that are mentioned here. In 1 Chronicles 12, we'll pick up in verse 30. My main verse I want to read is verse 32, but let's look at 30. Of the sons of Ephraim, 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous men throughout their father's house, of the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000, who were designated by name to come and make David king. To come and make David king. That's what they're doing, okay? Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Just their leaders, their chiefs were 200, plus all their brethren were at their command. Probably many, many thousands, not, not named the, the number. The point I want to read, though, make, though, is in verse 32. These men had understanding of the times. God wants you and me to have understanding of the times and to know what Israel, we, our spiritual Israel, should do. We're the Israel of God, okay? But they also knew what the country should do. Like I said, it was a tipping point time. Their previous king had been killed. Uh, this young king, this young man who was obviously being worked with by God, uh, they wanted just to make sure they did the right thing. They all came together. That was the right thing. And today we're going to be talking about that, how important it is to be people like the men of Issachar who had discerning, who had understanding of the times they were in and, the, and what they should do about it. God really, really wants us to understand that. Hello again. I'm Philip Shields. I'm founder and host of Light on the Rock. Dot org. If you like what we're teaching today and other times, uh, and there are several hundred sermons and hundreds of blogs, short articles on this website, just use the search bar and put in a key word or two, at the most three, but one or two words is best, and see what will pop up instantly that we've already covered. And uh, I just recently been talking a lot about things that will, I think, set it up for this. I didn't know what's going to give this sermon when I was giving the sermons about the wedding of the Lamb and the sermons about becoming holy and being holy and uh, about demonism. All of that was sort of background to this sermon today. We try at this website to help you have a free uh, experience. It doesn't cost you anything. We don't just give you part of a sermon. You get the whole thing. And to help you have a more intimate walk with Jesus Christ, with Yeshua, with God the Father, that they will know you, that God will know you, and, and that you will know him. As Paul said, that was one of his biggest goals. One of the things I want us to really ponder as I go through this in part two later, does God want you and I just to be bystanders, watching what's going on in the world around us, and besides praying a bit here and there about it, doing basically nothing, just watching it? Or does God want us doing something more? And I, I, hope, I hope you'll give careful thought to what examples I'll give uh, in part two. Part one's going to be the kind of things we need to be discerning going on right now in our country and around the world. Let's pick up now in Luke 12, verses 54 to 56. Je Jesus, Yeshua speaking. Hey, when you see a cloud rising from the west, he says, right away you know there's going to be rain because that's coming from the Mediterranean Sea. And he says, likewise, if you, have, if, if you can see a south wind coming up, you know because that's coming from the desert south that it's going to be hot. It's going to be hot, hot weather. And there is. You hypocrites, verse 56, you can discern the sky and the, and the face of the earth, but you, you, you can't discern the time. You don't understand the times you're living in. So he's saying, you people here are not like the men of Issachar. Not at all. You should be discerning the times, and you're not. In Matthew 24, verses 32 and 33, Yeshua, the Son of God, says, look, you can look at a fig tree. I'll, let's post it up here while I'm talking about it. You can learn a parable from the fig tree when you see its 
shooting out its tender shoots, its, its leaves and so forth, you know summer's coming, you know summer's near. So you also, when you see these things, what things? The things he'd just been talking about before, the prophecy of his return and the things that will come before his return. So when you see these things, know, know you're near, know you're right at the doors, right at the doors. It's interesting that to the church of Laodicea, we see Christ at the door, knocking on the door. He's right at the door for the Laodicean people. And for some of the other uh, uh, church groups, he says, I'm coming soon. With Laodicea, I'm right at the door, knocking. I'm here. Wake up. Answer the door. What am I doing outside your home? <laughs> That's what he's saying. And Yeshua added something else in Luke 19, verses 41 to 44. Uh, days before his crucifixion, he, he, he bewailed, he wept over the city of Jerusalem with these words in Luke 19, verses 41 to 44. As he drew near to the city, that's Jerusalem, and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. The days are coming when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you, your children within you. He says, even the children not yet born are going to be affected by this because this all did happen 40 years later in 70 AD. Your children, verse 44, your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Young's says, Young's literal translation says, because you didn't recognize the time of thy inspection. Thou didst not know the time of thy inspection. Complete Jewish Bible says, all because you didn't recognize your opportunity when God offered it. Christian Standard Bible, because you didn't recognize the time when God visited you. What's he saying? Because. I think he's saying, now we know Christ had to die. God sent him here to die and to live a perfect life and then die for us. We know that had to happen. But I think somehow if the people of his generation, if more people of his generation had not missed what was going on for real, um, it, he seems to be implying here that when he says, uh, you, you, in verse 42, he says, Let's put it back up, verse 42. If you had not, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, for your peace. But now it's too late. Okay, he seems to be implying that there may have been a delay in, in what was going to come in 70 AD or something would have changed had they just gotten it, had they just got a picture and understood the times they were in. And so that's pretty, uh, that's pretty severe. Uh, go back to verse 44, let's put it up again. In verse 44, and they will level you and the children within you because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't know God was coming here. Do you remember the many times that Christ even said in the days of Nineveh, uh, Peter re uh, I mean, people repented at the preaching of Jonah. And he says a far greater than Jonah is here. And he talks about a greater than Solomon and so on. And so he tried to give them hints of who he was. And he did even acknowledge that he was the Messiah to several people, like the lady at the well in John 4. So do I have your attention? God himself. Remember, Yeshua is God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Yeshua is also God. Is telling us to wake up, discern, realize, perk up your ears. Open your eyes. Be aware of what's going on. Please tell your friends and relatives and Bible-believing people that about this message. They need to hear it. They need to hear it. We need to wake up the children of God, especially, as you will see in, in, these, in this two-part. Too many are sound asleep. Sound asleep! And many more, if they're not asleep, don't have their armor on. They're out there walking around outside in their panties. They don't have their underwear, I mean their underwear, their full clothing on. They don't have their suit of armor, their helmet, their sword. They're out there in just regular clothes. They're nothing at all. In fact, uh, Yeshua says to Laodicea, 
uh, more stark than I, than I just said. He says, you're naked. You're naked, he says to them. And so, yeah, God's people aren't out there with the armor of God on fighting like we're supposed to fight and whom we're supposed to fight. We'll talk more about that coming up. There are things also to do and wake up. Now let's look at uh, Matthew 24, verses 42 to 44. You know, if you know a hurricane's coming in, sure, you might even leave town. But before you leave town, you board up your house, your windows. You, you bring outside things inside so they don't get destroyed and flown, flown out or flown up, you know, uh, destruct, cause destruction. And uh, you, you get some emergency supplies in, so emergency water, emergency food, and you pray. Sure, you pray, but you also do certain things. So Yeshua says in Matthew 24, verses 42 to 44, that watch, 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 therefore. Sure, watch yourself. Watch your spiritual condition is always the primary meaning of that. But secondly, watch and be aware of what's going on out there because you don't know the hour your Lord is coming. Matthew 24, verse 43. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. The Son of Man's coming at an hour you don't expect. So whenever I hear lots and lots of people saying, oh, it's got to be any time now. It's got to be this next month, this next year. I know when it's not going to be because he says at an hour, and he says this to his disciples, at an hour you don't expect. So when we understand the times we're in, there should be a lot of praying going on, sure. And there should be other things going on. But uh, a lot of things have to play out. The main thing we have to do is wake up right now and start doing the right things. Luke 21, 25 to 26 says it's going to be so distressful. We'll put it up. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Boy, that sounds like tsunami, doesn't it? Distress of nations. Do you not feel a sense of angst in your town, in your state, in your province, if you're in Canada? Do you not feel the sense of angst all around the world? When this thing starts to really roll, men's hearts, verse 26, failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. People are dying of heart attacks, stroke, fainting away, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. It's going to be so scary. Before I forget to, forget to say it, though, remember, you will have a hedge. You have, right now, a hedge around you. Remember when Job came and said, you know, does Job obey you for nothing? You put a hedge, Job 1, verse 9 and 10, I think. You put a hedge around him. God took away that hedge. And only then could Job do, I mean, the Satan do certain things to Job. We also have a hedge. For now, and I think, I think a big part of discerning the times we live in right now is understand this. We're in a tipping point time. A crucial time when major blocks of our understanding of what a society is supposed to be like is about to be toppled over unless, unless some things happen. If you knock down enough of the pillars supporting the edifice, if you knock down and blow up the foundation, that edifice falls, the country collapses. The far left knows that, and that's their aim. Satan knows that, and that's his aim. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to discern the times and discern that we're in a tipping point time. Are you in Canada? I'm talking about you. Are you in England and Britain? I'm talking about you. Are you in Australia? I'm talking about you. Are you in Africa? I'm talking about you. Are you in Venezuela? You've had your tipping point, Venezuela. I bet a lot of you would like to talk to a lot of our people here and tell them what's really happening. You've experienced it. I'm talking about all of you. And remember Nineveh, that when Nineveh repented enough that God noticed and he delayed the destruction of Nineveh for a long time because God noticed. I believe God wants 
his children very concerned about our country, very concerned about the world we live in, very concerned about what's going on, and very grateful that you have such a wonderful country so far that you have been raised in, that you're living in, and so forth. But there's an evil spirit that's flowing. The Bible says that Satan's going to be cast down from heaven in Revelation 12. You might read it later on. He attacks God. God casts him down. There's war between him and Michael and his angels. God casts him back down to earth. And then it says in Revelation 12, he's very, very angry. If that has happened or not yet, I'm not sure. It sure looks to me like it has. All I know is there's a very evil spirit flowing in the country right now. What I'm talking about right now goes way beyond politics. I'm not just talking about politics right now. I'm not talking about Republican versus, uh, versus uh, Democrats. I'm not talking about the liberals versus conservatives. Okay, wherever your parties are, where you are, the Tories and all that, whatever co uh, country you live in, I'm not talking about that. This has gone way past that. This spirit, this evil spirit I'm talking about is what's really behind what we're seeing and doing. Ephesians 6, let's read that. Ephesians 6, verses 11 and 13. Our fight is not against people who are rioting and looting and shooting and burning and defacing and toppling statues and all that. Our fight really is not against them. As much as you might be angry at, at, at them, we, I, I need to remind you the real source of what they're doing is not themselves. God died for those people. Someday they'll accept him. Even though right now they're against God and against religion. There's something more. Ephesians 6 verses 11 to 13. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Verse 12. But against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age. Paul, remember, was in the Roman Empire... Paul, remember, had gone through many beatings, imprisonments, lashes, scourges, scourgings, stonings. The Roman Empire was not the most helpful to Paul all along. And yet he's saying, look, they're not my enemy. The Jews aren't my enemy. The Gentiles aren't my enemy. The Romans aren't my enemy. He says, no, no. He says in verse 12, we, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Don't just take up your shield and forget your sword. Don't just take your sword but forget your helmet. Okay? And uh, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil days having done all to stand. Could it be that in the prophesied war against God himself that Satan has been cast down? There's definitely evil and wrath going on. But when God puts a hedge around you, when God puts a hedge around you, he can't, Satan can't do anything to you. And I think God has put a hedge around his people, around this country. I mean, even with 9-11... It could have been far, far worse. And all the other attempted, attempted uh, horrible things against the country that God has stopped. But once God takes this hedge off this country, we're in for a lot of trouble in your country. Your country as well. So my main point in this first part is to help you grasp that we're in very, very perilous times in these last days. It's not going to be business as usual all the time. But I do think that there will be times that we'll go back and forth between terrible times like we're watching right now in uh, July 2020 and June 2020. Uh, and then there'll be time of peace and safety and there will be building and marrying and all those things. Uh, just like in the days of Lot, they were marrying and giving in marriage and, and buying land and so forth. And then sudden destruction. So... I think we'll see a, a, an ebb and flow to this violence and all that. It'll get so violent, we'll say, oh man, this has got to be it. And then it's going to go to a lull for a year or two.
I really believe that. And then it's going to get real violent and terrible again, and then a lull again, until finally sudden destruction happens, like in the days of Lot and Noah. I gave a sermon recently about that, uh, the recent sermon about the positive view of days of Noah. So anyway, um, that was the point of the Noah sermon I gave, that the point was how suddenly everything can change. So some of you are okay with feeling it's all laid out. God's got it all in his, in his hand. It's all been chiseled in stone. There can be no changes now. The book of Revelation has been written. The book of Daniel has been written. And so nothing can change. Well, I see a lot of times in the Bible when God changed what he was going to do, postponed what he was going to do, when his people, who were called by his name, sought him and turned from their wicked ways. God heard, God saw, and he healed the land. You know what I'm talking about. So if you wonder what's going on around this, if you can find a Venezuelan, talk to them what happened to their country. Their country was once the richest, most prosperous, most powerful nation in all of Central and South America. And then the Marxists took over. The Marxists took over. And look how quickly they, they lost everything and went downhill. And uh, that should warn us to wake up because the Marxists are trying to take over here as well. The statue of Lenin in Seattle has not been torn down, but the statue, uh, statues of George Washington and even Lincoln and, and Thomas Jefferson, not just Confederate statues, Ulysses S. Grant, those are being torn down. It doesn't make any sense. Even the statue of, uh, of uh, the black uh, group uh, that, uh, of soldiers that fought in the Civil War, that was torn down. Other uh, great, even great black men and women, uh, those are being defaced and torn down. All I, all I know is we got to learn. We do know in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 6, this know that in the last days, perilous, dangerous, dangerous times will come. I mean, you can't, dangerous. We have seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds out there playing in front of their grandma's house, being shot in the head. We have people in a car, little children, Babies being shot in the head. Black on black crime that's causing most of that. Most of that. No one wants to talk about it. So a few do. Candace Owens. A few do. Attorney Terrell. He used to be, uh, he used to be quite liberal, but now he's saying we've got to wake up to what's causing all this. And there's a spirit moving around. Men will be lovers, verse 2, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unthankful, unholy, disobedient to parents. Are you kidding me? Uh, I remember in Los Angeles, Mayor Garcetti was telling people it's okay to snitch. Go ahead and tell us on your friends, on your parents, if they're not, if they're not following the, the lockdown rules or wearing a mask. Snitching was okay. Oh, they might get a great big fine. That's okay. Unloving, verse 3. Unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. There are verses in the Bible that says in the last days, people will call evil good, and good will be called evil. And so now if you stand up for the right thing, oh, you're labeled with all kinds of things. You're a white supremacist. You're racist. You're anti this and anti that. And people are so afraid to be a phobe, a homophobe, a, a, racial, a, a racist or anything like that, that they, they, they don't speak up. Verse 4, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. 
So you will have a part to do, but first let's talk now about what's, what are some of the key things we should be aware of. Here's key point number one. Starting 50, 60, 70 years ago, especially 50, 60 years ago, God is dead, Time Magazine proclaimed. God is dead. Maybe you can find a copy of that and post it up there. I remember that movement. And over the years, they threw God out of our society. Threw him out. They call it separation of church and state. And they forgot the phrase about freedom of religion and the free exercise thereof. And so school prayer was stopped. Teaching the Bible was stopped. I don't know how many of you remember or know that the early colleges, like Harvard, I think Harvard's our oldest university. It was formed, I think, in 1639 or something like that. I don't know the exact year, but it was very early. It was formed as a, as a teaching place to train clerics, ministers. To train ministers, clergy is what I meant to say. Boy, you'd never know that today, would you? You'd never know that today. God was thrown out of the schools and universities. He's mocked. He's laughed at. You couldn't bring a Bible to work or have the girls' soccer team pray together and ask God's blessing first. Even in some mega churches who say they're Christian, few verses are referred to, and they have traded it for pop psychology, feel-good sermons uh, that make you feel good, that you heard some good positive things thoughts, but not scripture, not correction to repent of sin. And in the fake discussion of separation of church and state, God has been largely eliminated. Oh, they'll bring in the Dalai Lama to speak to universities, but not men of God, not men of the true God. Ten Commandments monuments were torn down, taken down, defaced. God was thrown out. And, when, and then we wonder why things are starting to go downhill. Now God's name itself is cursed in profanity. Isaiah 5 tells us that there's a hedge around our nation. But it appears God is letting that hedge be torn down. And when that happens, there no longer is the protection that God's been giving the country for 244 years. But you individually still do have a hedge around you. Remember the story of Job. There's also the verse in Psalm 34, verse 7. Do you remember the story of Israel coming out of Egypt and how uh, God camped with Israel? He had the tabernacle right in the middle. He had the cloud above. He had, and, and the cloud would lead them. Sometimes the cloud would come behind them. But God was always there. God was always there. Even when they sinned, God still sent the manna. God still sent the water. Psalm 34, verse 7 says, The angel of the Lord, the angel of Jehovah, camps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. I think that's such a beautiful verse. That plus the one in Job 1 where Satan says to Job, I mean, Satan says about Job, he says to God, Have you not put a hedge around him so I can't do anything? So God says, Okay, I'll let you go this far. And then Satan goes as far as God allowed. But this is point number one. This is the pillar number one. When we threw God out, things began to change in this country. Get rid of God. When God was in the culture, when people went to church, when church was taught, when, when Bible was, was read in schools in the old days, when people even, my wife tells me that in, where, where she grew up, grew up in England, they, uh, they would say the Lord's Prayer every day. So people knew the Lord's Prayer. They knew what it said. We at least heard about the Ten Commandments. If we couldn't list all ten, we at least heard about them. And people, you could go to people's homes and they had, uh, they had like, it looked like a, a stone with the ten words, the Ten Commandments on it. And God made us rules to live by, to keep law and order, including honoring His name, including honoring our parents, including not stealing, not killing, not lying not coveting what belonged to someone else, not committing adultery. And if we had just followed those things and the first four commandments, 
had to do with loving him and honoring him and not having idols or pagans, uh, pagan idols. And then the, then the fourth commandment was the Sabbath day, keep it holy, a time to remember God. At least if we talked about the Ten Commandments, we had some knowledge at least of some of the Bible. When God was at the core of this nation, this nation was founded, remember, by people who had the Bible. Washington and our generals and our presidents read the Bible. They opened their meetings with prayer. When God was at the core, we, we knew that we were all made in the image of God. We understood Genesis 1. In the image of God created he them, male and female created he them. With the Bible, we learned in the New Testament that it didn't matter whether you were Jew or Greek, Gentile or not. God loves everybody. God died for everybody. God died for everybody. It didn't matter what race or ethnic group or part that you were a part of or what you'd done in your life or what your language was. God's Son died on the cross for you. For you and for me. For all groups. All of them, all of you, all of me, all of us. We knew that. We heard that. We were all created equal. All life mattered. All life mattered from conception to death. All life mattered. If you start having to put a color in front of the word all, life matters, that becomes racist by itself. All life matters. George Floyd's life mattered. He couldn't breathe. And now six policemen, several of them black police, now they can't breathe either because they've been killed by those who are trying to, they say, honor George Floyd. All lives matter. Some of those cops were black. All six of them now can't breathe either. When God was in the picture, we knew that all black lives mattered. The little children being shot the black police officers, conservatives like Candace Owens, like Judge Thomas on the Supreme Court, all lives mattered, all Hispanics mattered, all Asians mattered, and yes, even whites mattered. But right now there's a reverse racism going on because we've taken God out of the equation and we're starting to, you know, in California, they've actually voted to get rid of the uh, Equal Rights Amendment the, the, the non-discriminatory language in the Constitution of California, because that, that Constitution currently says that there shall be no one discriminated against or favored uh, because of race, color, sex, uh, creed, ethnicity, whatever it all says. But they, now they do want to favor certain colors, certain races. You watch. You know, there is reverse racism going on because we put God out and we've forgotten that we're all created in his image. Push God out of the public discourse and we end up deciding what's right and wrong instead of believing what our creators told us. And we're reaping the consequences of that. With, with God at the core, we learn that God sent his son to die for all of us. With God at the core, we learn that we have inalienable rights to, to live in liberty. There are lots of verses that talk God is, that tell us God has called us to be free. There are verses where Jesus said, like John 10, I think it's verse 10, I've come that you may have life and have life more abundantly. And, and I, I, I want you all to be in good health, he says in 1 John, or, or in one of the epistles of John, might be 2nd or 3rd John, to be in good health. These aren't in my notes. I'm just trying to tell you as it comes to mind, as God inspires me. God wants us, just like it's put in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, we have the inalienable rights to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as President Lincoln said, all men are created equal. I think that's in the Declaration of Independence as well, isn't it? I think it is. So, trend number one. Wake up, see it. God's been kicked out a long time ago, and it's getting more and more and more so. Trend number two, foundation number two, Satanism, witchcraft, drugs, sorcery, demonism, all of that's on the rise. I put drugs in there, especially illicit drugs, because the word that's translated sorcery, sorcerers, it's the same word for drugs, pharmacia or something like that. 
I see Harry Potter movies on the rise. I see Harry Potter movies on channel listing after channel listing, constantly playing and replaying them. And too many of you aren't smart enough to keep your children from watching Harry Potter. Will you sit down and watch just one of those? I have. I've watched a half of one to understand that when I speak against it, I know what I'm talking about. There's demonism and witchcraft galore. The whole thing's about a school of witches. But there's all kinds of demonism and witchcraft in there. Don't get involved in it. Wake up. I gave several sermons on demonism. If you haven't heard them, hear them. Because you better be ready. You better get your, 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 you better get your suit of armor on. It's going to get tough. And your enemy will not be human beings. Your enemy is going to be someone far more powerful. But he who is with us is far greater. He who is in us and with us. Is far greater than he was in the world. John tells us in 1 John, I think chapter 4. So um, in the very last day, Satan's given the key to the bottomless pit. Christ has all the keys. But Satan is given a key to the bottomless pit. And demonic forces are allowed to be, that have been locked up, are allowed to be released. And they're going to come back out with vengeance. And when Satan does have permission to do that, with God's permission, lets them out. We better be ready for it. We're going to start seeing some very strange things. I think I mentioned in my last sermon how in the uh, coming beast power and all of that that's to come, uh, demons will take over. Demons will, will infuse, will possess the lives of the beast power and the false prophet and so forth. And they'll be able to do incredible things. It's not just going to be ma magic acts. It's going to be demonic acts, spirit acts that are working through them. And if you're not aware of this and you don't understand this, you're going to be caught off guard. I want you to go to a bookstore. Ask them where the section on witchcraft is. And go there and just see how many books there are on witchcraft. And some of you are letting your children read that. Some of you are letting your children dress up on Halloween. Don't do it. Some of you are letting your children get involved in, oh, it's just for fun, these witchcraft kind of books. No, it's not. You're opening a door. That's the other big trend to be aware of. You're going to see demonism. Yeah, it's always been around, but you're going to see it in a big, big way in the coming months and years. Another big, huge pillar that's being attacked is believing that Law enforcement officers are there, no longer there, to serve and protect. It's being said over and over again, and too many people are believing it, that police are hunting down black people, hunting them down. That's a lie. Many of the ones being killed are black police. All cops are hunting blacks. It's a huge lie. Most black deaths by far come from black on black crime in their own communities. Just like most whites who are killed are killed by whites, most blacks who are killed are killed by blacks. 7,500 blacks were killed last year. Almost all of them, most of them, were black on black killings. Someone's got to wake up, talk about it. Don't you believe? that the police officer who every day has to wake up and as he puts on his uniform, realize I may not come home tonight. When I go to work, when you go to work, you don't have that thought. You need to and I need to compliment them, thank them when you see one. I've made a point to walk up to some and tell them. I've made a point on the phone if I'm talking to someone in my business whose husband is or wife is a police officer. To make a point to say, I want you to know there are millions of us who love you guys, thank you guys, appreciate you guys. And they always say, oh, that means so much. In many cities where there have been riots, the mayor, the district attorney, and even the police chief are often themselves black or minority. So explain the racism there. In many cities around America, the majority 
of the, or near majority, but in many cases, the majority of the police officers are minority and black. Why is that not being said? I'm saying it. That defund and abolish police movements, that happens. There'll be many, many more inner city people killed. Anarchy, lawlessness will absolutely set in in a huge way. And that's what the far left wants. They want confusion. They want anarchy. The ones who will be affected most are the poor inner black communities, inner city blacks. Another off-repeated lie that's attacking our culture and safety is that America itself is systemically racist. I had somebody write down, a black minister wrote this down on his Facebook, that we all need to understand, because I think he thought only the black people were watching and reading his posts, we all have to understand that our young men are being hunted down by white people. And I called him, I talked to him, I, I said, that was so offensive to me. And yet that's being told over and over again. How can you have a country that's systemically racist and vote a black president in twice? How can you have a country that's systemically racist and have so many mayors and governors and, and congressmen and officials in the government who are black? It can't be. There are racists, there are some horrible racists on both sides. But the racists on the black side who are calling the saying things against whites, that needs to be called out too. So there are racists. But up till now, I don't believe our country in the last 20, 30, 40 years at least, has been systemically racist. There are sections and parts of the country that are, there are people that are, there are groups that are. Yes, but please wake up and understand you're trying to be programmed by Satan to believe all of these things. I would like to ask you all also, go to the internet and just type in Black Lives Matter manifesto and see what they themselves say they're all about so that you understand Yes, I love white people, I love black people, I love Asian people. I was raised in a family with two minorities who were adopted by my mom and dad before I was born. I was raised as a minority in a foreign country. I was raised as a minority in a black community in San Francisco when, when I was a little boy. So please understand, and I married an immigrant Understand where I'm coming from when I talk about this. Go back and read the manifesto. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. They are against a nuclear family of dad, mom, and children. They are for a different kind of family of transsexual and transgender and gay and so forth. They're against any effort to stop abortion. They are for Planned Parenthood, which is an oxymoron. They're for ending lives, and most of the lives being ended are black. So how does that make sense? They're against our founding fathers, and they call them white supremacists. They're against um, God and church. Okay, They're against police. They want to abolish ICE, the immigration control people. They want to abolish the police so they can have free reign to do what they want. That's in their manifesto. They're against President Trump. They want to... Abolish him, <laughs> get rid of him. They're pro-abortion, okay? And uh, all of these things. And they're, uh, then, then go to uh, do another Google search, Black Lives Matter Marxists, and you'll see videos where the founding women, three women, uh, one of them very clearly says back in 2015, we are trained Marxists. If you want to know what that means, talk to a Venezuelan. People of Venezuela, they know what that means. They don't like it. They will warn you to run. I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself, 
and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. So please look up what the manifesto is all about. Do Black Lives Matter? Yes. I like to say all Black Lives Matter, including the black cops, including the conservative blacks, including the unborn blacks, including little children blacks. All of them matter. Why is there no fuss over the black lives being killed and chopped in Seattle? Why was there no fuss over the children? Not one, very little said about children being killed. In huge numbers now that cops are not showing up or, or, or quitting and retiring. Let's keep going. Another pillar. My, okay, so that was a pillar to understand you are being programmed to believe that you, in fact, are racist. If you just deny that, 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 that there's systemic racism, they'll call that racism. Anyway, it's just, it's just terrible to so understand where this is going and love the black people, love white people, love Asian people, love Chinese people, love African people. I mean, yes, I want you to know, by the way, yes, normally we don't try to brag about what we've done, but there are about 30 black children alive today because this work, Light on the Rock, is feeding them, keeping them going. Children whose parents both in Kenya had died of AIDS. And they were just little children when it all started. Now they're teenagers. I'm not racist. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. If you want to help support that, God bless you, we could use it. I was raised with that. I'm married to an immigrant. So please understand, don't let yourself get programmed by Satan that you are racist. Now, if you are racist, repent of it and love people of all races. If you're not racist and you know you're not, then don't let them program you to think that. The other thing happening, another pillar that's coming, that's happening, is the leftists have been indoctrinating our children for many decades. I would not put my kids in university today because what they're teaching them there is anti-everything you stand for. And now in Washington state, they want to teach kindergarten children about sex. They want to teach them about it's okay to not know whether you feel like you're a boy or a girl. It's okay if you have feelings, if you're a boy for another boy, if a girl for another girl. It's okay to try and experiment to show each other what you are. It's okay to have sex. They're t teaching this to directly and by nuance to kindergarten and grade school people, or at least they want to. Do you remain silent if you're a parent in Washington state? Do you, should you, are you to remain silent? Another big thing to be watching is we've all been programmed to look at Europe, to look at Jerusalem. We need to also be watching what's happening with China. You may not know this, but China owns much of American Britain right now. They buy these companies. They keep the American name a lot of times. So you think it's an American company. It's not. It's owned by China. They're building aircraft carriers. They've stolen our technology so, they're, so their fighter jets look just like ours. Their aircraft carriers are the latest design. They were all geared to become the greatest economic powerhouse in the world. President Trump helped slow that down. I'm just saying start watching more news about China. Be aware of what China's doing. They're trying to expand by taking over some islands out in the China Sea and building bases out there near Vietnam, near the Philippines to just control that whole area and that waterway and that area where so much of the world's traffic goes through. They come in, and the Chinese people, by the way, any of you in China who are hearing this, I'm not against the Chinese people. Chinese people can be wonderful, wonderful people. They are. I'm talking about the Communist Party of China. I'm talking about their leadership. 
This is Fiery Cross Island. It's a little more than one square mile in size, and it's home to a Chinese military base. There's a 10,000-foot airstrip, an advanced radar station, a missile defense system, and about 200 troops. But the strangest thing about Fiery Cross Island is that two years ago, it didn't exist. And neither did the six other Chinese military bases that have been built on man-made islands in the South China Sea. There's a dangerous rise in China going on. And with the Wuhan virus, something else, another pillar that we've learned, I hope we've learned, is how quickly everything can change on the turn of a you snap of a finger. With the Wuhan virus, we were going great guns with our economy. It's expanding and growing and powerful. And then boom, overnight, it all changed. And I'll talk more about maybe why next time that, that, that happened. We've learned new, new terms, terms we didn't used to have to use. Lockdown, instead of quarantine, quarantine. The Bible says to quarantine the sick, not quarantine the well. But anyway, we're quarantining, lockdown, flatten the curve, social distancing, slow the spread, face masks, self-isolate, contact tracing. Six months ago, you wouldn't have known what half those words meant, contact tracing. But overnight, here we are. And beware, beware about how quickly this all changed, how quickly we also lost our civil rights. How quickly we lost. And we're told you can't leave your home. You can't go to church. Oh, you can go buy pot. You can go buy liquor. But no, you can't go worship. You can't go to your church. Oh, you can congregate by the millions nationwide in riots and protests, peaceful or not, with masks or not. They weren't arrested. They weren't told to disperse. They were encouraged to get together. But if you try to even just listen to your minister speak from within your car in the parking lot, you were summoned and you were given fines of $500 per person in this one, one case I'm thinking of. What a disgrace. Overnight, we lost a lot of our civil liberties, the freedom to congregate peaceably. Overnight, we're told to stay home. Businesses were closed by the months, overnight. Many have gone bankrupt. The whole food chain, uh, restaurant chain, uh, Sweet Tomatoes, is closed down forever. You weren't allowed to even live, leave your home in some countries. Neighbors reported you if you did. You weren't allowed to go to church. You weren't allowed to go see your friends. You weren't allowed to see your husband or wife or dad or grandmother or grandfather or mom in a nursing home. My own brother has a wife with Alzheimer's in a nursing home he hasn't seen for months now. Wonders how she's doing. Wonders if she'll even recognize him when he, he does when he is able to see her again. Not allowed. When my wife's mom died, only 10 people were allowed at the gravesite. 10! And only for 15 minutes. But somehow, if you're going to protest, hundreds of thousands of you can get together and that'd be okay. But no, you can't walk across the sandy beaches of a beach. I mean, people don't go to a beach and then all congregate. I mean, you don't want to have your towel right next to someone else. But if you want to protest, you want to burn, if you want to loot, if you want to throw bricks and rocks and fire into police cars, that was okay somehow. Some mayors even seemed to encourage that. They certainly didn't stop it. Understand, discern the times of what's going on, brethren. So this is a foretaste of what's coming on to the whole world, the kind of power that will be exerted. And now I just found out today, by the way, that even our own Justice Department is trying to get Congress to allow the cancellation of habeas corpus, the right to appear before a judge and plead your case, uh, the right to be judged and tried speedily. In cases of emergency, they're trying to get, be, be able to say, no, that's gone. We could hold you indefinitely. We could arrest you without the right of habeas corpus. Where are we going? 
Are you awake? Now add to that several Supreme Court decisions. I'm going to go a little long today because there's so much to say, so many, so many things we have to open our eyes to see. Since 1973, it has been okay for you to end the life of a fetus growing inside of you women that was made legal throughout the land, abortion on demand. Since then, over 60 million lives have been snuffed out, have been snuffed out, have been destroyed. The Bible speaks of there shall be a loss of natural affection. It used to be the safest place for a fetus was within her mother's womb. And I understand that an unexpected pregnancy to someone especially very young or alone could be terrifying. I understand that. But nobody can excuse pulling apart the arms and the legs and the head of babies. They actually will try to pull, you know, if they're further along in term, they actually pull them out by the feet first, keep the brain inside longer so they can harvest parts. It's just awful. Then, okay, we'll talk about abortion again some other time. That's a big thing to understand. It's going to get worse and worse. The Defense of Marriage Act was struck down in 2015. So therefore, gays marrying became the law of the land. It's all was leading more and more to uh, even a freedom to experiment, a freedom to bring it up in school. It wasn't just a matter of getting married. It was a matter now. It was, it was open doors to teach our kids about it. And then on top of that, just here recently in June 2020, another uh, SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the of United States, of the United States, uh, the Supreme Court now has defined sex uh, to be de defined of whatever you want it to be. There was a law passed in the 60s that you could not discriminate for employment or housing and things like that due to color, race, ethnic origin, sex, whatever it all said. So the word there, sex, was brought up. You can't discriminate because of sex. So now the Supreme Court says, well, that doesn't mean male or female. It means whatever you want yourself to be seen as. That didn't get a lot of play in the news. You may have heard about it. It's huge. Absolutely huge. And a total, total, uh, even the Supreme Court justice who voted for that had voted against that very same thing when it came up before. But now because, uh, anyway, he, he voted for it this time. So now they, uh, he, now they say you can't discriminate for transgender, gay, anything. Locker rooms, shower rooms, bathrooms, I think you'll see in the months ahead are going to be fair, fair game. It's already been fair game in some stores. We were at a Macy's one time and uh, I, I saw a man go where my wife had been, in the women's changing area, and I, I went out and I said, there's a man in there. Well, sir, we can't do anything about it. So I called my wife and I said, okay, I'm not going to shop here anymore. But that's going to be the law of the land. That's going to be the way it is. And you are going to be called all kinds of phobic names if you don't go along with it. I want to ask you to read Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18. Uh, on your own. We'll come back to it in a minute. But in June uh, 2015, gay marriage was approved. And then in, in June 2020, sex is now defined whatever you want it to be. It now means sexual orientation as opposed to being a biological male or biological female. It now means sexual orientation. So no wonder we also, we're going to see more and more of these. I might have to end it with this. I have so much more to cover, but we'll have to cover it next time. There's now sex confusion. What's a boy? What's a girl? It used to be easy to explain. Now we're gender neutral. There's no male. There's no female. Don't buy into that. Understand our battle is against Satan and his minions. Satan does not have sex. Satan is sexless. He's not male or female. And he wants everyone to be like him. So he's confusing what a male is, what a female is. Don't buy into it. 
already many children in some schools are being taught it's there's no such thing as a definite boy or girl if you feel like you want to be a girl that's fine and even in Canada there was somebody who was born there and the on the birth certificate the parents refused to say male or female they said we want him and he comes to his teen years to decide for himself if he is male or female confusion of the sexes will lead to much much more confusion and you'll see sexual taboos erased now that it's gender neutral and now that uh, sex is defined as sexual orientation that's the key word to get here sexual orientation you're going to see in the years ahead that you can marry whomever and whatever you want whatever you want um, sexual taboos will be gone so the idea that uh, sex within family members will be depicted in movies more and more you watch implied sex and actual sex with animals will be discussed and in jokes and finally in movies sexual immorality is going to skyrocket as a result and if you read luke uh, leviticus 18 which i think we'll start with that next time uh, god says if you get if you lose your identity of what you are and you start doing these things that i'm saying are wrong leviticus 18 The land will vomit you out like it vomited out the ones that were in Canaan before you. The, the land that I took away and have given to Abraham and given to you. The land vomited them out for their evils. A lot of it was related with their sexual evils, which I don't have time to finish today. But um, evil is being called good, vice versa. Free speech, free thought is being lost. Okay, so we'll pick up some more of the major uh, pillars to watch Jerusalem got to watch Jerusalem got to watch Europe but especially Jerusalem so we'll pick up from that next time and um, my main point this time is open your eyes discern the times use this time to get closer to God than ever before make sure he knows who you are don't let him say to you as he did the five foolish virgins who ran out of oil. Depart from me, I never knew you. And he shut the door. Don't let that happen to you. So let's bow our head. I'll just quickly close here. Our Father in heaven, our great God and our creator who made us male and female, who has a great plan for your children, has a great plan for your people, has a great plan for all who will accept you and accept your son who died for all of us thank you for being you thank you for your word that teaches us and keeps us on the right path thank you for the hedge you put around us thank you for your guardian angels thank you for the protection you've given us father in heaven we just raise our hands to you in worship and praise and ask you to flow your holy spirit in greater amounts to me to all who listen to all your children uh, as we listen to these sermons and these messages and study your word and walk our walk in the daily life, that you'll be pleased with our walk as we walk in the Spirit, as we talk in the Spirit, as we pray in the Spirit, as we live in the Spirit. We love you, dear God. We love you, Yeshua. Thank you for everything you've done for us and continue to do to us. Come live inside of us. Let your life be our life. Let, our, let your joy be ours and let us really start looking more and more like you. Finally, I pray you give us discernment. You let us see things as never before. Help us understand what's going on, like the sons of Issachar, and help us know what to do about what's going on as well. Father, we bow our heads and adore you and love you and Yeshua. We bow our heads to you too and worship you too. Thank you for all you are and all you've been to us. Let your light and your face and your blessings shine on us and put your guardian angels around your people. Put your thick hedge around their lives. In Jesus' name, in Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father 
and his son and his incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.